Hey, if you have your Bibles, don't you turn to Nehemiah chapter 3. Don't you just love the book of Nehemiah? Such a great book and such a great book for, for men. The women are having a good time too, but it's such a, a, a great, great time, a great book for men. And one of the best commentaries that you'll ever read on the book of Nehemiah, and you can pick this up, you can get it actually on Amazon, it's by a guy named Alan Redpath, and it's called Victorious Christian Service. And he begins his commentary on chapter four with these words. He says, we are studying the life work of one of the greatest characters of the whole Bible. Nehemiah's courage and determination in the face of the fiercest opposition, his complete faith in God, his great passion for the service of of his Lord, all of these things point him out as a man in a million, a man whose life is worth emulating, whose character is worth our close scrutiny and examination, and whose example by the grace of God and the power of the indwelling of Christ, through whom alone we can do anything, is worth reproducing. And then he ends this quote with this. Indeed, the service of the Lord Jesus Christ today desperately needs men of the caliber of Nehemiah, end quote. And you know what, guys? My prayer is that the Lord would make us men here at Calvary Vista, that he would make us those kind of men. And so far in our study, we have seen the burden of Nehemiah, the burden he gets for the work in chapter one, that he sees the, you know, here's about the, uh, the devastation that has gone on in, back in Jerusalem. He's 1,500 miles away in Persia, but he hears of the, the devastation that has happened back in Jerusalem and the need for the walls to get rebuilt, and he gets a burden. And then we saw in chapter 2 that there, there, it was the preparation for the work that, that he made. And we noted that all of us here are building something in our lives. Hey, Mike, 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 it's okay. It's okay. We already, we already did that. Bill already did that. I said the ladies, if they were with their husbands and didn't want to go, they could stay in here just sitting in the back. Okay? All right. Okay. (laughs) These guys are trying to help everybody, but um, it's good. It's all good. So anyway, um, where was I? Okay. We, We noted this, that everyone is building something. All of us here. We are building something. The building process in the Christian life never, ever ends. Hope you realize that. The, we're, we're building this ongoing building that's going on in our lives personally as men. The walls of prayer, the walls of purity, the walls of, of passionate devotion to Jesus are being built in our lives we are building as it relates to our families seeking to build family structures that are centered around Jesus the walls of of building for purity and passion in our marriages are things that we are to be constantly building guys the building never ever ends but it starts with a burden it starts with the realization the burden that hey something is broken down something could be improved something in my life needs to get better and i need i have a, i have to have a i got i get a burden from the lord for that but here's what we also need to note is that whenever there is that building there's also battling that takes place and that's what we're going to see tonight in nehemiah we're going to end up in chapter four but the book of nehemiah reminds us that whenever there is 
that building going on spiritually, there's always a battle that's taking place. Because whatever, whenever God is seeking to build, Satan wants to tear down. Now, the building actually starts in chapter 3. And Nehemiah is appointing people to different parts of the wall. And if you read through, it's a lot of names, but if you were to read through chapter 3, you would see these phrases a lot. The phrases next to him, after him, next to them appears over and over and over. And what that tells us, guys, is that this was a unified effort, that the people of God were working side by side. And that is always a beautiful thing. When we, the body of Christ, and, and men of God are working together side by side. That's how the most, the most get work gets done the best way. Side by side. All different ages. Working together. Building the wall together. Engaged in the work together. I'm reminded of Psalm 133 that says, behold and how, how good and how pleasant it is when the brethren are dwelling together in unity. And, and I think for, for guys, you know, we love to come together and work together in the things of the Lord. We also see there that Nehemiah does something in chapter three that is brilliant. And if you wanna notice in verse 10, verse 28, verse 29, and verse 30, we are told that these workers were assigned the work that was in front of their own house or their own dwelling. So picture this. Nehemiah is appointing guys on all different parts of the wall that surrounds Jerusalem. And different guys are, you know, covering different parts of the wall and they're working to rebuild it. I mean, they're all kind of doing this work of, of being masons, you know, and building the wall. But there's certain groups that he has them work right in front of their own houses. Why was that smart on Nehemiah's part? Anybody want to just, just a better job? Why? <laughs> okay, a better job because they're going to look at it every day. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. What, why else is that smart? You're vested. Yeah, you're vested because it's like, hey, this is my house, and so I want this to be done the right way. It was brilliant. And listen, the place where we should be the most vested, all of us, is in our own houses. Our own houses, our own families should be the place that we are vested the most. But oftentimes with men in the church, we can be more vested in our places of business. Or we can even get more invested or vested in ministry that we're involved with. And our house and our kids and our families get neglected. And so that is something that we need to make note of because that, it should be the opposite in our lives. Our first priority, our first ministry is always to our families. Well, tonight, we're gonna come to, we come to chapter 4 and we see the, the first form of opposition that they're going to come up against. And it's that of ridicule and scorn. We're going to cover verses 1 through 9 tonight. It says, but so it happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of the rubbish, rubbish stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, whatever they build, if even a fox goes up, on it, it will break down their stone wall. In other words, it's not going to be very strong. And then we read in verse 4, Nehemiah's response. Hear, O God, for we are despised and turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out before you. For they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half of its height, for the people had a mind to, bit, to work. Now pay attention to verse 7 and 8. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the Ash. 
Odites, heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry and all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God and because, because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. The first thing I want you to notice here is that the enemies are conspiring together. I want you to note that in verse 7. They're conspiring together to come against the work of God. And we learned in chapter 2 that Sanballat was a Horonite, Tobiah was an Ammonite, and we also see that the Ashadites are here, and the Arabs all coming together. Here's what you need to understand about these groups. They weren't friends. These groups of people, they weren't allies. And yet here we see that, that what brings these four groups of people together who weren't naturally, you know, together, they weren't allies, what brings them together is their hatred against Israel. The hatred against the people of God. We see the same thing in the life of Jesus. You know, if you follow and read in the life of Jesus, what do you see? The, you see the Pharisees and the Sadducees were these two groups in Israel, these two religious groups, and these guys did not get along. They weren't on the same page theologically, they weren't on the same page politically, and they weren't on the same page socially. But what's interesting, they joined forces in coming against Jesus to get him crucified. And we've seen in our study in the book of Acts that these two groups have come together. These groups that didn't like one another have come together against the church of God in the book of Acts. And this still happens today. It's happening right now in the Middle East. Groups that, that normally don't necessarily like one another coming together against Israel. We see that in our culture today. Groups that don't get along, but they come, they join forces against the truth and against the people of God and the ways of God and the work of God. So I want us to note tonight that their first tactic is scorn, and we're going to see how Nehemiah and the Israelites respond to this. Notice verse 1 again. It says, when Sanballat, here's the scorn, heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant. He doesn't want the people of God to be fortified. Satan doesn't want the people of God to be fortified. He doesn't want your life to be strengthened and fortified. He wants us to remain vulnerable and weak. So he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? This is all mockery that he's bringing. Will they revive the stones from the heap of rubbish, stones that are burned? And then Tobiah the Ammonite jumps in and he says, you know, whatever they build, even if it's not going to be strong. If a fox runs on it, it's going to fall down. And here's what we need to realize, guys. Anytime that you decide to make a change for the better in your life, anytime that you decide that you want to grow spiritually, anytime that, that, that you decide, you know, I want God to use my life, note this, the enemy is going to be whispering in your ear, that'll never happen. He'll be whispering in your ear, oh, you're too weak. You're too weak for that. You're too dumb. You're not spiritual enough. God couldn't use you. You're never going to get a handle on this. When you are seeking to re rebuild the walls of purity in your life, let's say. You, the, the enemy is there whispering or sometimes screaming in your ear. You're always going to be this way. You're never going to have victory over that thing. It's never going to happen. Sometimes our enemy will use the voice of others. It's not just him whispering in our ear, but it, it, it could be somebody close to us. Maybe you decide, you know what, I want to get more into the word. I'm going to start bringing my Bible with me to work, and I'm going to read it at lunch. And so you put it there on your desk, and then all of a sudden one of your coworkers is going, hey, what is that? Are you like the Bible boy now? What's going on? What's that about? 
Or maybe you decide that, you know, I need to take and, and be the leader in my home. I need to start having family devotions. And your wife ends up being the one that raises up. And she's like, you think after 10 years, you're going to lead the family now, you know? And there's that scorn and that ridicule, and it's the enemy just wanting to, to put you in your place. Remember David? Remember when David comes to the battle against Goliath and what they said about him? They said, you are too small, you're too young, you're too inexperienced. That's always the voice of the enemy. So what do you do when that type of opposition is coming against you? Here's the temptation. The temptation is to lash out. The temptation is to fight back with words. The, the temptation when they're shouting at you is to shout back louder. That's the temptation that all of us face. But here's the question, guys, and a couple of gals. Here's the question that, that the enemy is, or the, excuse me, the Lord is always wanting him to do in our lives is he's wanting us to learn how to respond in the Holy Spirit. And respond to the Holy Spirit rather than reacting in our flesh. Our natural tendency is to want to react in the flesh and to fight the flesh with the flesh, but we shouldn't do that. We have a great example in Jesus in this. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, it says, When he, speaking of Jesus, was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten. But committed, here's the key, committed himself to him who judges righteously. When Jesus was being reviled, when he was being mocked, he didn't give heed to it, guys. He didn't get distracted by it. He committed himself to his father, and he committed himself to the work, to the mission that God had given to him. He committed himself to the reason and purpose for why he was here. And Nehemiah does the exact same thing. Notice how he responds in verse four. He responds in prayer. He committed himself to God. He doesn't fight back their ridicule with, with, with words. He doesn't you know, get into a shouting match. He turns to God. Let's look at his prayer again. He says, hear O oh, our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Now, if your wife is mocking you, you probably don't want to pray this way about her, okay? Just, just, want, to, just want to say that, all right? Um, do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. I love this prayer. I just love this prayer. It's so bold. It's so honest. He's saying, Lord, we're not going to go on the offensive. We're not going to get into a shouting match with them. We're, we're not going to get into a physical confrontation with them because you fight for us. God, you are our defense. And I want you to be thinking about something. We're going to do groups again tonight, guys, after the study. And I want you to be thinking about this question. This is going to be one of the questions tonight. Is how does this apply? What we see Nehemiah doing here. The way he's responding. How does this apply to us as Jesus followers living in our culture right now? The second thing we, I want you to notice that Jesus did is that they do that Jesus did is that they, they keep their focus on the mission. Notice verse six. So we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. So it was, the work was halfway done. For the people, this is a key thing, the people had a mind to work. And I love this because this is not passivity. It's not like, okay, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get into a shouting match. I'm just going to pray. No, it's not just that. You know, sometimes we as Christians can fall into that, that, that mode. We're like, I'm not going to get you know, into this shouting match, I'm, but, but I'm just, I'm just going to pray. But there's a, that's the first thing that we need to do. But the second thing that we need to do is be busy about what we're supposed to be doing. 
That we're to be busy about the work that God has given us. We're to be busy about and be focused on what God has put before us. We have a job to do, and we're, the, the point is, is we're not supposed to get sidetracked and sucked into pettiness. Now, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I see different people that I know and even you know pastors that they, they get in these online battles with people like on Facebook, and, and you look at this, you know, conversation that's going on. And I always just think to myself, how in the world do you have time to do that? I don't have time to do that. How in the world do you have time to just engage in this online conversation with people that you don't even know? And you're arguing about something that, that is not going to make any difference whatsoever. It just blows my mind sometimes. Don't get distracted. Don't get caught up in, in, these, on, or in these, these petty things. The enemy loves to distract us. I love this. The people, they, they had a mind to work. We see, three key, three key, we see three key things about the attitude and the actions of the people of God in these verses. In verse, the first is in verse six, that they had a mind to work, that they just stayed at the task. They're not getting distracted the second thing we see is in verse 9 is that they had a heart to pray. So they had a mind to work, they had a heart to pray. And the third thing we see is that they had an eye to watch. Notice verse 9. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to God, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Listen, working, praying, and watching go hand in hand. They are such keys to staying focused in the Christian life. Again, Redpath draws a great connection on prayer and working in his commentary. He said this, in the Christian life, if we have no heart to pray, we have no mind to work. Have you noticed if you forget to pray or feel you have no time to pray, how irritable and critical you get? If you have no heart to pray, do not go on working. Listen, when Jesus faced his greatest work, the greatest work that was before him, remember what he did the night before he went to the cross? He goes into the garden, and what did he do there? He prayed. He prayed. He poured out his heart in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane is called the Olive Press. And it was there that Jesus was being pressed. He was agonizing over his heart for us and for a lost world that he sought and desired to save. So he's agonizing there. He, it says that he was praying and, and he was sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. And remember what he was praying? Father, if there's any other way, let this cup, speaking of the cross, pass from me. But then he said this. This is key, guys. But not my will, your will be done. So, so we could say that Jesus spent the night in prayer yielding his will to the will of his heavenly father. And that's what we're doing in prayer. We're yielding our will to the will of our heavenly father. He used prayer that night, Jesus did, to keep him focused on the work that was before him. And that time in prayer helped him fulfill the mission Guys, prayer is a key for helping us stay on mission and to help us in the work that God has given to us. Prayer is, is meant to help us be the men that God has called us to be. And I want us to consider for a few minutes the idea of prayer times, because we need to, it's important to have prayer times, versus a prayer life. When I think of prayer times, I think of those times where I take my list of the things that I am praying about and I keep them on a place, you know, in my phone because a lot of times I like to walk when I pray. And so I have this prayer list in that prayer time that I'm working through those things that I'm praying about in the morning. Sometimes at lunch, I'll go for a prayer walk. 
And that's important. I think we need to have prayer times on a regular basis in, in our lives. I, I, I would hope that, that you would spend the first part of your day or at some part in your day praying. Praying for your family, praying for the church, praying for the needs. You know, I love to take the Lord's Prayer in uh, Matthew's Gospel and, and using that as an example for me to just praying through those different points. There's also days where once about every six weeks or so, I will do a prayer day. Or I'll take a day that I'm just setting it aside and I just want to get away somewhere and just seek the Lord all day long. That is such a great thing to do if you have a chance ever to, to do that. That's important. But we are to live, guys, a life of prayer. And here's what I mean by that. Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Rejoice always and pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Pray without ceasing. What does he mean by that? What does it mean to pray without ceasing? Well, literally, it's talking to God throughout your day. And here's what I think that looks like. I'm going to a meeting, and I pray, and I talk to God before I go into that meeting. And I ask God for his wisdom in that meeting. Ask for his grace in that meeting. I'm meeting somebody for lunch, and I talk to God about that lunch meeting before I go into it. I have a tough call that I'm going to be making or a, a, a situation that's going to be difficult, and I'm bringing that before the Lord. I'm driving down the road, and, and the Lord brings somebody to my mind. I think he's doing that because he wants me to pray for them. So I'm bringing, I'm bringing them before the Lord. Looking for those, just those opportunities all throughout the day. What that does is two things. It's creating in us a heart of connect, connectivity where we're constantly just connecting ourselves with the Lord. And it's also creating within in us a heart of dependency. But I tell you, in order to do that, you have to discipline yourself to turn off the noise. We can get so distracted by the noise. So we see here the people had a mind to work, a heart to pray, and an eye to watch. And this is another key element in dealing with opposition is we have to have that eye to watch. The Bible says that we're to be aware of the schemes of the enemy. In other words, we're to be on, on uh, watch for his attacks. Did you know the enemy never, ever takes a break? He never goes on vacation. He never goes on holiday. So that means we need to be on guard to notice those attacks. We should, listen to me, guys, we should never, ever, never, ever be a victim of a surprise attack of the enemy in our lives. Because the Bible tells us over and over and over again that we are to watch we need to be attention we need to pay attention to the weak areas in our lives and we all have them all of us have those areas that we are more susceptible to, 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 to temptation all of us have those areas in our life where we're more vulnerable to the attack of the enemy and here's what's interesting is I think in, in those things, we, we tend to be on guard the most. Like we know, like, okay, this is an area in my life I gotta watch out for, so we're watching out for. But you know, you know the area you also need to watch out for is where you're strong. It's been said that a double, that a strength can be a double weakness. And you know why? Often in the areas where we think that we are strong, we drop our guard. And we think like, oh, I'm okay. I don't need to worry about that. I'm good. You know, me and my wife, we're good. I don't need to worry about, you know, that area. Huh, that's, the, that's where the surprise attack comes in. So you need to be on guard. You need to watch in the areas where you're weak, the areas where you're strong. And I want to just end tonight by considering these exhortations in Scripture about watching. We're told in Matthew 26, verse 31, to watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. So we're to be watching. Be on guard against temptation. 
We're told in Mark 13, 33, take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, we're told, we're told this, therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. So we're, we're watching there as it relates in those two verses to the urgency of the day and the time in which we are living. In Luke 21, verse 34 through 36, we're told, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life. Now, some of you are like, oh, yeah, my days of carousing and drunkenness, those are over, but what about the cares of this life? What about just the, the responsibilities and the weight of the things that we have to carry as the men and being the providers in, of our families in this crazy economy that, that we're living in? That weighs down upon us. It can distract us. And notice what he says, that, the, that you would be weighed down by the cares of this life and that day come upon you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that come to pass and you would stand before the Son of God. He's speaking there about the, the coming of the Lord. Being watch, watching, staying on point in the last days. What about this one, Second John 1 verse 8, watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. That's heavy, isn't it? Watch. Be on guard that you don't lose what you've already worked for. That, that's a sober one to me. Because what it's saying is that through neglect and not giving careful oversight, when we start cruising, we can lose the very things that we've built, that we've worked for. And finally, this one, 1 Peter 5, verse 8, be careful, watch out for, the, for attacks from the devil, your great enemy, because he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for some victim to devour. Be on guard because we're in a spiritual battle, guys. It was Warren Wiersbe who said, the Christian life is not a playground, it's a battleground. And I tell you what, guys, the sooner we realize that, the better I see a lot of men in the church pretending like this life is a playground. And they're all about just, you know, wanting to have fun and wanting to escape. And hey, this is not a playground. It's a battleground. We are in a war and the enemy is after us, guys. And he wants us, the Lord wants us to stand. So what, is, what does he say? Take heed to yourselves and watch. So may we be men that are focused not giving in to trivial things, not being distracted by the cares of this life. May we be men who have a mind to work, that we're about the things that God has entrusted to us. May we be men who have a heart to pray, that we're seeking the Lord, that we're building a lifestyle of prayer that marks our dependency upon God. And may we be men who have an eye to watch. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for these men here tonight. And God, I pray right now that as we break up into our groups for discussion, that God, you would minister by your Holy Spirit, that you would bless. God, I pray that you would just let there be an openness and that in these group times, God, that it would be a time of just iron sharpening iron, men building up men. Because, Lord, we realize that we're all of us, we're in this together. We're all fighting similar battles. And so, Lord, we want to be men who have a mind to work, a heart to pray, and an eye to watch. And so, God, we give you these time, this time now, in Jesus' name, amen.